Welcome to the Kinjas Podcast. Here we will discuss dance, life, and whatever the f we want. Folks, welcome or welcome back to Kinjas Movement in the Shadows. We are your hosts, Ben and Anthony. And we are very excited for today's guest. Today we have serial entrepreneur and licensed attorney who is on a mission to spread financial education. His YouTube channel has over 1.5 million subscribers. We have self-taught chief executive money nerd at the Minority Mindset Companies and the Minority Mindset YouTube channel. We have Jaspreet Singh in the pod today. That was a very nice introduction. I, well, I just kind of pulled it off of your website. I'm oh, is that on my website? Yeah, I was going to say, can I borrow that from you? So <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I appreciate that. Well, Jasper, first of all, man, thank you for your time, bro. We know you're not, you're not, you don't live here in LA. No, no, I'm from Detroit. From Detroit. Detroit. Okay. Yeah. So are you just out here for, for business? Or? Yeah, I came out here for some work. So I lined up a few interviews and then my man reached out to me. Anthony reached out. So I was like, dude, yeah, let's get together, man. Because yeah. last time I was here, we got together and it was a lot of fun. So You guys did JK? We did JK yeah. News. Yeah. Uh, this guy came on and my whole world was blown. I love his story. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just like, I mean, we're going to get into it. Yeah, so no yeah, spoilers yeah. on that one. But like, even my wife has listened to you. No ben way. had mentioned that he's listening you know, to so your funny story. thing is, I've listened to you on two of my favorite pods, uh, School, of, School of Greatness with yeah. Lewis Howes, Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu. So I'm, I've already heard your story. Oh, I just wow. didn't put the two and two together because I listen as I'm driving. Yeah. So I don't have a face to put it to. And I'm like, when I, as soon as I heard your voice, I'm like, wait, I know this guy. And then I like looked up the YouTube because I'm like, oh, it's that same dude. That's so, awesome. Man. I was like, this yeah, dude man. sold socks, dude. We got to bring him on the pod. Yeah. Well, let's get into all that. So <laughs> as, as our first it. time first time guest, we love to get into origin stories yeah. and however deep or whatever you want to get into, like how you grew up, where you grew up, the whole thing. Feel yeah. free to walk us through. Sure. I mean, my parents uh, are immigrants. They came from uh, a state in India called Punjab. And uh, like a lot of immigrants, they didn't come here with too much, but they wanted to hustle, you know, came for the better life. And so I was born here uh, in the Metro Detroit area and growing up like a lot of uh, first generation immigrants, my parents were very strict on education. They're like, you got to study hard. And they gave me two options that I could either be a doctor or I could be a failure. The choice was mine. Doctor or failure. So it was like, you pick which way you want to go. At least you had a choice. I, I did have a choice. So uh, it was, it was like super strict because like they were very like adamant that like as soon as like i started talking they started telling everybody just breathe is going to be a doctor and i was like oh all right so i guess i got to be a doctor and it's hard i think especially like if you don't grow up in that type of household to understand how strict it can be and the the best example that i have is like when i was in eighth grade i was like 12 years old i was about to fail my english class because my parents were like don't worry about english you don't need english to be you a doctor <laughs> all you need is your math and sciences as long as you got an a plus in those classes you're good but they got me a tutor now I'm thinking I'm going to get a tutor for the English class that I'm struggling in. The guy comes to the door. He's a tutor to uh, help me with the MCAT, the medical college admission test, which is the test you take when you're in college to get into medical school. And here I am, this 12-year-old kid. I've never even taken a proper biology class. And he was like, you expect me to teach this guy? And so that was where like... That's how strict my parents were. That like you have to be a doctor. If you're not doing something that's educational, it's a waste of time. Playing sports, waste of time. But I wanted to play football, so I kind of like I did it anyways. Uh, through a lot of fights, and I, in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to do something different. I had this like entrepreneurial bug. Started working at weddings. Um, I used to play this drum called the dold. So I started playing this drum at weddings, and I didn't tell my parents I was doing that. I told them I was hanging out with my friends. So I was making a little bit of money doing these things and I had to be very selective with which weddings I worked at because if there was potential people that would like clash or would know my parents, I had to like avoid those right, weddings right, and yeah. refer those ones out. How old were you at the time? I started doing this when I was like, I actually first started when I was like 13 and then I really got into it when I was like 14, 15, 16. Damn. Time out. What do you, what do your parents do? Or so what, what were they doing at that time? So when my dad, so my dad was educated as a veterinarian. Uh, okay. But when he came to this country, he didn't have any license, so he had to work uh, as a janitor. Or uh, he, started, he first worked as a janitor, but then got fired from that job. Then he worked in a manufacturing, uh, not many. They were they were a assembly line where they were like, I think it was VC, a, a VHS disc, like a movie. So he would like add flyers to movies, and then he kind of slowly worked as a technician. Then he eventually got a job as a veterinarian and then kind of did that. Oh, wow. 
My mom, um, yeah, my mom did a bunch of things kind of, um, uh, she, she was a technician for a little while. She worked as a real estate agent. Uh, she was, uh, stayed at home for a little while. So my mom kind of like hopped around between jobs, trying to figure out what exactly she wanted to do. So, uh, they were working a lot, uh, especially my dad, like my dad would pretty much work six days a week standard, sometimes seven uh, if we had Saturday and a Sunday off, that was like the long weekend. So he was really big on like yeah. no days off. And so like, we, I mean, we were okay financially. Like we, we were comfortable. Um, so like when I was growing up, it was me, my mom, my dad. And then when I was born, my grandparents came from India as well. So they lived with us. So it was five of us. So you're the only child. Born. And no then my brother was born oh, later okay. on. So then it was six of us together. Um, and yeah, man. So I started hosting the uh, working at the weddings and then when i was 16 one of the djs that i was working with was like hey you know a lot of kids in high school how about we host a teen party I was like, okay let's do that so there was a new indian restaurant in town and they wanted promotion so the dj that i was working with happened to like i don't know how we met the owner i think he just liked the food there so he kept going there and they became friends and he was like hey how about you let me host parties here now it wasn't an indian party it was just a regular party at an Indian restaurant. So, you know, it's a teen party, <laughs> wherever you can get started. Yeah. So we started hosting parties here for free. The guy just wanted exposure. We would charge cover. And uh, that's kind of how I got into this event planning industry. So now I go to college. I don't know what to expect here in university in America. I didn't know that people go to college to party. I thought people go there to study. So I go to college. <laughs> a misconception. Yeah. I, go, a I, get, one, I got to college and I, I, I don't even know what to bring. I don't even tell my parents I was going to college. It was such a weird thing because I think it was a Wednesday and I was like, mom, I'm leaving. She was like, where are you going? I said, college. She said, okay, uh, when are you coming back? I said, I don't know. Uh, Cause I don't really know. How, I mean, how it worked, right? Like I was like, I don't really, I only applied to one college. I was really like confused as to how the process works. So I don't have much guidance in that. Wait, somehow, so your parents didn't have this like, you need to go to college thing? So no, you, they did. Okay. But they just assumed that I figured it out. So they didn't know what school. They They're know. just like, just go to a college and you'll, you'll, you'll they were be like, fine. Go, oh, my dad was like, go to Harvard. That's all he said. Like, go to Harvard, go to Harvard. <laughs> and, but, but I knew, I was like, I'm not getting into Harvard. So I'm not applying there. So all my dad said was go to Harvard or maybe go to Princeton. Were you always a studious, like good student? Through high school. I mean, I, I wasn't like, like the smartest kid. I was like probably like in the middle, like I, I got a lot of Bs, right, in high school. So I was like, I did a, I, I studied hard. I worked really hard in high school, but I wasn't like a straight A student. So now I was like, I'm not going to Harvard. I'm not going to Princeton. I'm not going to the Ivy League. But I was like, well, let's see where I can go. I got into, I applied to the University of Michigan, which is the only school I applied to. And I was really focused on football at the time because it's like, Football is during the fall, and that's when people apply to college. So I was like, I'll, I'll apply to one school. I like University of Michigan because I've heard of that school, and I watch its football games. That would be cool. And that's really it. I knew it was a good school, and I applied there. And then um, the football season went on. We went to the state championship. So we like it extended really long, and then we lost the state championship. But I hadn't gotten into any college. And all of my friends are now like, oh, I got this acceptance letter. And I haven't gotten in anywhere. And I've also only applied to one school. So I was like, maybe I should do something about this. Like, maybe I should like apply to another school. And the <laughs> day that I went to go open up the application to apply to a second school, I got into U of M. So I was like, well, I'm done. I got wow. into school. So I got oh, into college. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Were you already declared as a major? I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what that is. You're just there. You're like, I'm just happy to be here. I just got into college. (laughs) So I I got to college. I got into University of Michigan. Like I wasn't like bad in school. I did good in school. I I studied hard. And then I got to the University of Michigan. And I brought like five things with me. I had a sleeping bag, a microwave, my backpack, and a couple other things. I just remember I didn't have a towel. You just <laughs> mentioned three or five. You couldn't remember the couple other things. I couldn't remember the one other two. Could have been That's a towel. 40%. It, it was, okay. I know it wasn't a towel, and I know one of them wasn't a pencil because my first pencil I found okay. on the ground. So I remember these things. <laughs> so I, like, I brought some things, but I forgot like some of the essentials. And so I, I, you know, I just kind of went, and my dad called me that evening. He's like, "Where are you?" I said, "I'm in college." He's like, oh, "Okay." And so it was like it was one of those things where I just kind of went and didn't really know what to do. So now I will get to college, and I'm at my dorm, and people start drinking. 
I, I don't know what, like, I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? Because I'm not exposed to that, like, young people drinking, young people partying. Like, yeah, I've seen it, but I was like, don't You kind of hosted it, though, right? I, well, yeah, I host, I host, yeah, and that, that's the thing. Like, I hosted it, but I... I just thought like that's something you do like on a Friday night, right? Or right. maybe a Saturday. So this is like, like sure. yeah, this is kind of shocking. This is happening at so school. We're right? on a Wednesday. Yeah. Like right. we're supposed to be like getting ready for school tomorrow. Like what's it was kind of like, okay, what's going on here? So I thought you know it was an exception, but this just kept happening. And I was like, and I saw how much money people were spending because I I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I wasn't like doing that stuff, and people were just blowing money that they didn't have. And I was like, well, this is interesting. So I was like, well, why don't I bring this high school party business to college and figure it out? And that's what I did. So uh, I started knocking on the doors of the clubs over there, just, just going there. And Ann Arbor, where University of Michigan is a nice campus. And so I'd go to these like venues and they were like, yeah, you can host a party here, but we require a $10,000 deposit. It's like, I don't got $10,000. <laughs> right. like, so I can't do that. So he kept going until eventually they found this one club. They were like, yeah, you can host parties here. Just give us 50% of uh, the cover that you bring in. So I was like, okay, it doesn't cost me anything. Then I talked to my DJ friends. They were like, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't pay us anything. We'll just take half of whatever you bring. So if we make $100, the club takes 50. The other DJ takes 25. I'm left with 25. Mm -hmm. But I was in business. And that's how I started. Um, the event planning company started from there. It started off kind of rough. But uh, over the years, it started to grow. And it was a pretty, uh, I mean, for a college, it was a pretty successful business. And yeah, man, that's how I started. And that's how I started getting into the whole world of entrepreneurship. That led me into investing. That led me into kind of wanting to do something different, realizing I don't want to be a doctor and going down that route. So what was about entrepreneurship that was exciting to you? I liked the idea of controlling what I do. I like the idea of being in charge. I didn't like kind of being, I didn't like the idea of being an employee, first off. I, I didn't like the idea of working for somebody else, following somebody else's rules. I always did things different. Like that was like something I always did. Was that like a natural thing for you? Or do you feel like you were, you maybe had some role models or, or something like that, that you were following subconsciously even? So subconsciously, I think I got it from my grandfather. Uh, right. My grandfather mm. was really big and I didn't realize that until like oh, maybe the last five years um, that like he always did things different than everybody else. And, um, you know, I just kind of thought it was normal because he was always like, if everyone is doing something, I'm going to do the complete opposite. If everybody believes something, I'm going to believe the opposite. And he was really big on that. And I think over the last few years, I realized, okay, I think this is like genetic. I got this from my grandfather. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so subconsciously, I think it was from him. And so I think for me, it's like when I, I just kind of, I also started to get really angry. This was like between my sophomore and junior year, I'm studying to get into medical school. Now I'm take, studying for the MCAT. And um, I started looking at rental properties because I was reading books. Like I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. So good. And mm -hmm. I was like, hold on. Wait, what is this whole thing called real estate investing? Because I had never hmm. heard of this concept before. I didn't know any real estate investors. I never heard of like passive income. Like I was just like, what is this? Let me see if I can do this myself. And Michigan was hit really hard by the 2008 crash. So home prices were like rock bottom at this time. So I was like, well, let's start looking, you know, if there's any rental properties for sale. And I had a little bit of cash saved up now from these parties that I was hosting. And I found a condo on sale uh, for $8,400. That was the price of the condo. Wow. And I thought that was normal, right? Because like I'm this 19-year-old kid. I've never invested in real estate before. I've never really looked at real estate before. I don't know what real estate investing was. This is just the price that I see. So I have nothing to compare it to. I saw that previously the same condo sold for like 150 grand. But I was like, I guess this is normal. And so I, I looked at the condo. I made an offer because it was in foreclosure. Made an offer to the bank for $4,000. And they countered at seven grand. And I was like, no, that's too much money. How about 5,000 or something like that? And then they came back and said that there's another potential buyer uh, who made an offer. So give us your best offer. And I was like, okay, I kind of like this deal because I've looked at a few others. I'll offer $8,000 because I could afford that. And they said, okay, they accepted my offer. The other guy who made the offer offered less than I did. So they, they sold me the home for, or condo for $8,000. And I closed on that property on August 23rd. And August 22nd, I took the MCAT. So it was like the next day I went, 
everyone was like celebrating. I went straight to the closing the next day to go close on this property. I bought the property. Uh, I was 19. I remember this because I went to the like the closing, the title company. And you know, like when you're 21, your ID turns this way before yeah, that. It's yeah. like vertical, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the title agent looks at this and she goes, I don't know if you're old enough to buy real estate. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and I'm at the closing. I brought the check with me. I'm like all ready to go. So she goes and calls her boss. She's like, can 19, like someone under 21 buy real estate? And they had to like go figure this out. And they were like, well, I, we don't, we can't figure it out. So I guess you're buying it. So uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. That's so I, I, I gave them the eight grand. They gave me the keys. And now I, I bought this property. And like the the beautiful story, like the 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 kind of the punchline that people love to hear is I rented it out for $600 a month. So now I was making like 250 to 300 bucks a month of profit. But the kind of the true story is this was the biggest pain of my life that I just signed up for <laughs> because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. So I found uh, I found a tenant myself, even though I had a property manager. Apparently, my property manager was like not even a real company because they're no longer in business. I don't think they were properly licensed at a property manager. They were just cheap. Yeah. And I was like, well, cheap is better, right? Because it's less more, more money <laughs> right. for me. So they didn't do anything. Uh, they, I found the tenant. They moved the tenant in, but didn't sign a lease with the tenant. Wow. The tenant would have issues and call me instead of the property manager. And so like, it was like, I remember coming out of my classrooms and I would get calls from the tenant of everything going wrong. Like I remember like, and I'm, this sounds funny, but this is a hundred percent true story. She, the tenant would call me crying, like bawling her eyes out. I was cutting cucumbers just put it on the countertop. I missed the cucumber and I scratched the countertop. You have to give me a new countertop. And I'm like, I don't like I'm like this lady, old lady, just screaming at you about how she scratched the countertop because she missed the cucumber. Like, you, you're right, you know what I'm saying? Like, and now she wants me to buy her a new countertop, and I don't know what to do. I'm like freaking out. I'm getting yelled at on the phone, and I was like, okay, I'll buy you a new countertop. So I bought you a new countertop for she, missing the cucumber. Wow, missing the cucumber. Uh -huh. One day she calls me saying that this apartment's about to burn down because like it has major electrical issue that the whole place is like. Uh, it's not safe to live in that it, like it's it's on the verge of just being imploded. I freaked out. And this is after like multiple instances like this. So I felt really bad. So I, I took an envelope and I put like $50 of cash as like, here, let me help you. Um, I get there, I gave her the cash. I bring an electrician. He looks at it. He goes, oh, the light bulb fused. That was it. <laughs> and it's like, so now I am dealing with all this stuff. And... I'm learning while well, I was learning while I was doing, I didn't realize I was learning. I just thought I was going through like a big pain in the butt, <laughs> but you know, that's like where I started learning. Okay. If I can figure this out and I can like figure out how to make this passive, I'm getting paid without me having to host a party. I'm getting mm -hmm. paid without me having to see a patient. Mm -hmm. And this like, you know, we, I read about this idea of passive income in books. Seeing it was a whole different thing because like growing up, it's you go to work, you get paid. If I'm not working, I'm not getting paid. Yeah. And that's like what I was like bred to believe. You right. have to work your butt off. That's how you can make more money. The harder you work, the more you make. And that's true to an extent. But this idea of now you can put your money to work and actually seeing it. All right. Yeah, you were just talking about passive income and the idea of your money making money for you. But the crazy thing to me is that you're doing this at age like 19. Like, I didn't get the idea of that in my head until, like, my mid-20s or later, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and by that point, there's already this feeling of, like, regret. Like, oh, my God, if I would I would have started sooner than compounding my money would have been this, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just different stuff like that. Would you say that, like, because you say you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it, so were books and things like that your sort of mentor? Because... Normally, you know, you'll have your your father kind of telling you yeah. like, hey, this is how, you know, money works or this is how you should, you know, view uh, work uh, versus like your time and all that. Like that mentor figure, was that mainly just through your own self-education? Yeah. So, I mean, for financial education, it started with books. Like my dad was definitely a role model, like when it comes to like hard work. And hustle. My grandfather was for sure a role model, like never given up because my grandfather, he was a refugee. Uh, he lost everything. Our state of Punjab was severed in 1947. And so if you were a Sikh, the person of my religion, and you were on the West side, you had to come East or be killed. And so he left his family and he literally fought for his life. He saw his uncle get his head chopped open in front of him when they got wow. attacked. And so he literally fought for his life. And all he had was a sword in his hand and the clothes on his body 
he even lost his shoes along the way. So now he comes to the New India, no shoes, clothes, nothing, no money, nothing. Well, actually, he had a little bit of money. It's a funny story because he, he laughs about it now. He's like, I had a little bit of money in my pocket, <clears throat> but I spent it all on one meal uh, because <laughs> I didn't know the, how money really worked. And so mm. I, I was like, oh, this, this looked delicious. So he's like, I spent all of it. And then I realized that now I have nothing. Like I have, <laughs> I have no money for food, no money for like anything. So he's like, I slept outside just in random areas. And um, eventually he like found, he randomly saw his brother on the new side of India who's riding his bicycle uh, on the street. And so he chased him down and said, hey, he was like, how did you get here? He's like, well, how did you get here? And he's like, hey, come with me. And so like his brother kind of like uh, took him under his wing for a little while and gave him a little bit of money and kind of, uh, didn't I mean his brother also had nothing because he also came to nothing but like now they try to work together to kind of figure out how to make a little bit of money so then you know he went came from that and then so you know he taught me a lot of lessons of like you know you don't complain you know you don't complain about problems you you deal with issues because mm -hmm. for him it was like if I complained I'd be killed and so you know I had those role models but one of the things that he talks about is how for him poverty or poorness was the biggest disease because like in our religion giving back is a huge component of the religion it's called seva but he's like there was no concept of trying to help other people when you're starving yourself like yeah. you have no money mm -hmm. to feed yourself how am i supposed to go help somebody else right. and he's like this is that you have to be practical and now like you need to be able to take care of yourself so like the idea of you need to become successful was really important because if you want to be able to give back to your family, take care of your family, you want to take care of your community, you got to be able to take care of yourself. Now, how do you do that? That's why I was like, go become a doctor. Because everybody knows if you're a doctor, you're like, you're making good money. Right. But what we don't understand is that's just a small piece of like the financial education puzzle. And that's where now I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad for the first time. And I hated reading, man. Like, I, I don't think I ever read a book cover to cover. Uh, one, Same, I'm not a reader. Dude, I, I struggled with it. And I, I, I was like really bad at it. Like I remember I, I literally like almost failed my English class. And I, I, like my grades were like A, 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 maybe an A minus or B plus or something. Then it was like D, English. And my parents were kind of like whatever about it. My mom was not happy about it. Well, they didn't get you an English teacher. They gave you an MCAT teacher. They got teacher. me an MCAT teacher. So they were like, <laughs> there was always like the thing was like, your English grades don't matter because you don't need to be able to, like you can speak just fine and like yeah you, if you can't spell something who cares as long as you can treat someone's surgery and whatever you'll be fine i was like okay it made sense to me so I, then i picked up rich dad poor dad and i used to be like this nerd when when i used to go to india i used to take all my backpack my and all my books because i'm like i'm gonna study all this time when i go to india so i packed up my backpack i was going to india and i put all my textbooks in there i put rich dad poor dad in there for whatever reason i think actually my dad gave me that book and um, so I, I packed up my bag and I, I'm on the plane and this is before like, like you went to India, like now they have TVs and stuff on planes. Mm -hmm. Back then there was no TVs. It was, they had one central TV, like in the aisle way and everybody would try to watch that. And it was a small black and white screen where they show these like, like boring Indian movies, which I didn't really want to watch. So you're on the plane for like what, 14, 15 hours. Yeah. You get really bored and you're sitting like this, like a sardine and you're like, man, I need something to do. So I would I, you know, try to find things to do. And I picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad then. And I started reading and I would, for the first time, I was actually interested in it. And I was like, whoa, like this is either this guy's lying to me or I've been lied to. Hmm. And so I was like, that's, that's kind of what started it. And then I started reading more books and I still don't like reading, but I listen to audiobooks now. Uh, that's, that's been me. yeah man yeah. it's so much easier i'm guessing rich dad poor dad was like super uh relatable at that time for you too huh because like you know how like basically especially yeah. from his voice he's talking about how his his dad yeah. was not his rich dad it was his mm -hmm. poor dad yeah so that's why i remember the first time i read it too i'm thinking my well shit my dad was poor too you know what i mean i'm <laughs> like i'm trying to look for, and i know my cousins or my friends or whatever that got them rich dads yeah you know what i mean i'm like what's different yeah. so i remember that just stuck out that, to me. that's interesting you say your dad gave you that book so yeah. Was that something that he also read? Dude, I don't know. And that, I, I know he read it after. I don't know if he read it before. I think mm. somebody might have been like, hey, you should read this book. It's really good about money. And my dad was like, like go read this. Son, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was right. something like that. Um, uh, uh, but you just get, and man, I, that was like one of the things that like, I'm so glad I picked up that book and started reading. Because, I mean, it, it really changed the way I looked at things.
And so that was kind of like the first exposure, which then made me more interested. Then I started reading more books, doing more things. I did that first real estate deal. I did some more. And that's kind of like what really put me into that journey and then started learning. And I was like, you know what? I'm not being a doctor because this isn't going to work. And then the whole thing was, I told my parents, yeah, I'm not going to be a doctor because they didn't know what I was really doing. They, I kind of told them I wanted to do real estate, but I kind of didn't tell them too much because they weren't really cool with the whole idea. And then when I said I didn't want to be a doctor, oh man, it was like all hell broke loose in my house, man. Uh, my mom, like my mom literally didn't believe it. Like she was like, this, this is not possible. Like there's no, like it, it can't be possible that you're not going to be a doctor. Like you have no other skills. Like, what are you going to do in life? I was like, mom, what if I be the CEO of a company? She's like, you're too dumb to be a CEO of a company. Like there's no way somebody like you could be <laughs> the CEO of a company. Like you, like what experience do you have? What knowledge do you have? You don't know anything about business. You can't do that. And I was like, I know, but I want to figure it out. And so it was like, my mom just, couldn't i mean it came out of love right they just didn't sure. know anything yeah, else yeah. it was just like what we've been all so accustomed to i think it took my mom like a year to 18 months to actually believe i'm not going to medical school and it wasn't until like i'm like graduating college and i haven't applied to a single medical school that she's like this is he's serious he's not going to medical yeah. school so that's when they were like you have to at least go become an attorney to keep some pride in the family with the whole thing, I was like, oh, man. I was like, okay, you're right. But for me, it was like, if I go to law school, I can do that part-time, but work on my business full-time. And so that was kind of my my thinking. And uh, so that's what I did. I like did a whole bunch of businesses. Because now I had a few rental properties under my belt. I realized I need more money to buy more rental properties. And then I did like anything that I could get my hands on. I first got my real estate salesperson's license. So I started selling real estate. I was wholesaling real estate, which is kind of like a form of flipping. But instead of actually buying the property, you're just entering into contract and flipping the contract. I got onto Amazon and eBay selling stuff online. I started a sock company. And some of these things would make a lot of money. Some of them were really bad. Uh, like the Amazon company, it was, we were me and my friend, who was my business partner, I guess that's like the technical term. He was my boy. And <laughs> we were uh, buying things from China. We know what that's like. We know what that's like. <laughs> and so we were just buying things from China, selling them online. And this, this, this is like, I mean, more than 10 years ago. So this is before Amazon FBA, when people really knew what was going on. And the, the guys from China were like, yeah, we're 100% authentic resellers of this stuff. We're like, oh, okay, they're legit. So we're buying a bunch of stuff and sell. And we started off small and we started really like, I don't know what happened, but we actually started to grow really quickly on Amazon. And we were like, at our peak, we were probably making like a one to $200 a day of profit, which when you're like, you know, 20 years old, it's a ton of money. Yeah. It's a, that's, a that's lot that's of great. money on the yeah. internet. And so we were like, we figured it out. We cracked the code. So now we're like buying a bunch of stuff from Amazon and we're selling it online. And then we got this letter from the authentic retailer for this company. And they were like, you're selling counterfeit stuff. We're going to sue you for $7 million. And so we were like, oh, we don't, have, <laughs> we don't have insurance. We don't have $7 million. So we shut everything down like that same day. We shut down the online store. We shut down the brand. We deleted anything that we had. We we're like, we just like, hope it right. goes away. And luckily it did. So we got very fortunate with that. But, you know, it was like a big learning process. And that was kind of like what made me interested I, I just love this idea of kind of creating something i knew that's what i wanted to do i knew i wanted to build something of my own and it was a whole process of learning what is a business what does it mean for a business to be scalable what kind of value can i provide and going through that whole process of trying different things and like figuring it out like that's what's that's the thing that you can't really replicate because you know a lot of times people especially on the internet and this is the mistake a lot of people make and i see is they're like I want the five step system to make 10 grand a month. Man, if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it. And it's mm. it sucks because like, you know, you can hear stories of like, dude, I went from nothing and I made 10 grand in 60 days by doing this. But what most people don't see when that happens is they went through 2 years of like a whole bunch of crap to learn how to do something that can make them 10 grand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the part where it's like you cannot replace that. It is really tough. If you want to do that, but the one thing that everybody can do, because not everybody should be an entrepreneur, everybody can start investing. And 
the most important thing is just starting, whether it's with $1,000, $100, even $1, start. Because we're not taught this. And the later you start, the less wealth you will build. And I, I gave this, I was on an interview yesterday and I was like, look, somebody making 50 grand a year can become significantly wealthier than somebody making 100 grand a year, even if they invest the same percentage of their income. Because if you're 50, making 50 grand a year when you're 21, you invest 15% of that. $7,500 a year. You get the historical market return, 10%. And then you compare that to somebody making 100 grand a year who is partying in their 20s. They start when they're 30. They invest 15% of that, which is $15,000 a year. You get the same return. The dude that started when he's 21 who's investing half the money is going to retire with more than a million dollars more money wow. than the dude who's making twice as much money as him. And it's like, time is the most important thing. Why are we not taught this in high school? Why are we not taught this in college? Because anybody, like, if you start with $4 a day when you're 21, and that's all you do for the rest of your career, you can still retire a millionaire if you just invest $100 a month from 21 until 66. At the market historical return, you will retire a millionaire. But most people learn this so late, and now you're trying to play catch up, and then you get really overwhelmed. And that's what makes it so difficult. Now, if you're 35 and you're watching this, it doesn't mean it's too late. It means you got to get started and actually learn and put in that effort. And that's that's the whole thing that I'm really trying to push with minority mindset. It's like, look, we're not taught this stuff, man. And, and right. why are we not taught it? I got my own reasons. I really think that like, like the system is designed to keep people poor. And it sounds really like weird to say that. And I get it. But like, dude, if more people were financially smart, it's going to be a lot harder to keep you in debt. Right. It's going to be a lot harder to get you to buy things that you don't need. It's going to be a lot harder to get you to like blow all your money because the more money you spend, the more money somebody else makes. Right. If I'm going and I'm and I'm going into debt and I'm buying a whole bunch of Gucci and Louis Vuitton, they're making more money. But if I'm smarter with my money, I'm spending less money. It's not so good for Gucci and Louis Vuitton in the short term. But when I can build my wealth, then I can buy whatever I want. And so my whole thing is like, look, I'm not saying don't buy the nice stuff. Buy it when you can afford it. Make mm. yourself rich first. And it's a complete mindset shift. And this is where it's like, man, why aren't we taught this? And it and that premise ended up building my businesses that I have now. Yeah, but it's like, right. it, it, it's that it's that real that financial education that I really feel like we need to be taught this. So you, you're dropping so many freaking gems right now. So there's so many questions that I have. Um, I think we start with, the basic question, like we're talking about finance, we're talking about money. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, what is money? Like what what does money mean? What does money give opportunity to? Like, why should people care about um yeah, financial wealth, abundance, freedom? Like, yeah. what is money to you? So money buys freedom, and that's all it really is. Money is not gonna make you happier. Money is not going to make you feel more fulfilled. It can help you get there. Like, like, because I don't want people to misinterpret that. Because if you don't have money, you can be depressed. You can be miserable. You're not going to be able to pay your bills. You're not going to be able to take your wife or your husband on that trip that they want. You can't pay for your kid's college. You can't give your kids what they want. I mean, you, you live this life of scarcity and then that not just that poorness transfers, but that mindset transfers to the mm. next generation. Because then, then, you know, your kids are going to grow up and they can say, they're going to say, we can't afford that. We don't have money for that. And that's what, you know, we go through this like, <clears throat> this generational like mindset more than just the bank account. Because people assume generational wealth is how much money I have. No, dude, it isn't here. Because if you can teach your kids to say, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do whatever it takes to do it. Dude, you have the real wealth here. And this is a different currency of wealth. Mm -hmm. So money buys freedom. And this freedom can be, I'm going to go on a trip. Or it could be, I'm going to send my wife wherever she wants. Or this freedom can be, my parents are sick. I'm going to send them to the best hospital. And like, this is where like, you know, the big thing for me is like, look at the reality of what the world is, not what you, what you want it to be. Because people will say, well, everybody deserves the best health care. Okay, not everybody gets the best health care. Who gets the best best health care? People with the most money. Mm. And I'll tell you this from personal experience because my parents, my grandparents, they lived with me growing up. They moved back to India when I got older. And then last year, they came back to America. 
much older. Um, now they need constant help. And they were living with my aunt and they were starting to have some health issues, but they didn't weren't fully registered in the health system. And so they were like, we don't know what to do. And I was like, who cares? I, I called the doctor to come to our house. I was like, look, I don't care how much it costs. Like, why does it like, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm fine financially. I'll cover all the costs. We had doctors come to our house, do all the tests at the house and, you know, do everything. And it's like, if you have money, you have the freedom to do things the way that you want. It's not going to make you a good person. It's not going to make you a bad person. It amplifies who you are. Mm. So we need more good people with money, right? I, the, yeah, the thing right. that I say is like, I like food and money is like icing. Your life is the cake. You can have a whole bunch of good icing, but if you have a crappy cake, it's not going to cover it up. <laughs> right, you yeah. got to have the good cake and the icing makes it that much sweeter. Yeah. And understanding that money is just one aspect of life. Uh, I, I like to say that there's four like parts of life. If you want to live a full and fulfill life, I call it my quadrupit theory, which is you first got to be physically fit. Now, I'm not saying you got to have a six pack, but if you're, if you can't breathe, if you are dying, if you are like morbidly obese, if you're, if you are, you know, that saying that a, a sick person wants one thing, but a healthy person can want a thousand things. When you are really unhealthy physically, you can't do anything. So you first got to just take care of your physical health. Yeah. Second is your mental fitness. And I'm so glad that now, especially in the Asian culture, it's starting to become a little bit more like aware where people are realizing, you know what? Mental health is important. If you're dealing with depression, you're dealing with anxiety and like, it's like a real thing. Cause there's a difference between like, oh, I had a bad day and like, yo, I'm depressed and I can't get out of bed and I don't want to do anything. Take care of that. Like realize one, it's a thing and it's okay and you can get better, but you got to get help and actually do something. Maybe you start with YouTube videos. Maybe you start listening to podcasts. Maybe read books. Maybe you go into rehab center. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it costs. Because if you are not okay mentally, it's, it, it doesn't matter how much money you have. More money is going to make you more miserable. And we all know somebody, because I know people who are like, man, if I just made a million dollars, man, I'm going to find my wife. I'm going to find the right wife for me. I'm going to I'm gonna have all the nice stuff. Like you imagine this world that if I had more money, all my other problems in life would be solved. Yeah. And then some people achieve that money and now you become even more miserable than ever before because you realize that money wasn't causing that like emptiness. So it's realizing that you got to make sure you're mentally okay. You're surrounded by people that you love. You're not surrounded by toxic relationships, that you're, you're in a good, healthy mental environment. Then it's your spiritual fitness. And this is more like, what's your purpose? Like if you had all the money in the world, what, what's your reason to get out of bed now? And this is where a lot of, you, you hear a lot of people who get rich become depressed is because they don't realize they have a purpose. I made the money. Now what do I do with my life? Like, am I done? And this is where now, what is the reason why you're on this earth? And you know, this is not something you have to know today, but trying to starting to think about that. If money wasn't an issue, what would you do? And then finally, it's financial fitness. It's, all right, I got these other things, but I also want to make sure that I'm financially fit so I can do whatever I want financially, take care of my family financially, and take care of my community financially. Because the reality is, look, man, if you don't have money, you're going to be at the mercy of people who do have money. Mm, and, totally. Mm -hmm. And this is where, look, get that money for yourself. Right. So, I mean, that means money is pretty dang important, right? And I say that because, like, you, you, the other, you know, three parts of that right there are, like, body, mind, and soul. Yeah. Those are pretty, like, yeah. you know, in, in almost every concept, philosophy, religion, those are things that are, like, boom, boom, boom. You got to get this stuff straight. But, like, for you, like, money is right there, like, a, as, like, a fourth peg to a stool, you know what I mean? But And, and I appreciate that, actually. I respect that a lot because you don't uh, realize how freaking fundamental and important money actually ends up being. Currency is in your life. What, like, yeah. you know, like what you said, not just how you want to see the world, but, like, how the world actually is. You yeah. know, money is so darn important. Mm -hmm. So, um, just, it, it's just crazy. Uh I, I guess more so dope to just hear somebody actually kind of put it up at that pedestal of the same level of importance as like your body fitness, your mental fitness, your soulful fitness and stuff like that, or your spiritual uh, fitness. Um, I do want to ask you though, like you talk about your spiritual fitness. Yeah. You talk about if you had all the money in the world type stuff, you know what I mean? Like what's your purpose? Can I ask you like, what's your purpose? So, you know, uh, and that, uh, that's a great question. Like I, I think about like, you know, if I was 70 years old, I had all the money in the world, what would I do? 
and I wouldn't do anything different than I'm doing now. Like I, I have, I'm very fortunate that I've, I've made good money. I've made good investments. Like if I never worked another day, I would be okay. So for me, it's like, I, I enjoy what I do. Like I love entrepreneurship. Like, don't get me wrong. I want to make more money. Uh, I like kind of what I'm doing, but for me, it's now spreading. I love the idea of just spreading this education. And I forget who I heard say this recently, but it, it was a quote where somebody was saying that happiness comes from making other people happy. Yeah. And I, I, I really resonated with that because that's how I've felt for a long time that like, I don't really get a lot of joy getting myself things. Like I really don't really care. But when I get like my somebody else something, when I make somebody else happy, that brings me a lot of fulfillment and joy. And I really like, I mean, I think I am able to spread this education. I've built a platform that allows me to do that and helping to show like, look, dude, wherever you are in life, that's okay. If you want to be somewhere else, you can get there. Because I think a lot of us, we grew up with crazy dreams. And then somewhere along the way, those dreams get crushed. It might be your parents, it might be school, it might be your job, it might be your spouse. Something comes along the way and you have to put your dreams on hold. And some people are able to then say, you know what, I'm going to follow my dreams. And it's and I used to like really analyze this uh, when I first started YouTube. And it was kind of like, I didn't know what type of content to create. So I just started look, studying successful people. And so I would like look at people like Steve Harvey. And he was like a big like inspiration for me. Because I was like, what made Steve Harvey Steve Harvey? Yeah. He wasn't like some special dude that grew up with like everything. No, man. Like he he literally, he was, he was a janitor working the night shift. And one day he saw his his boy on TV, on Comedy Central, living his dreams. And he was like, man, I gave up because people were laughing at me when I said I wanted to be on TV. He's actually doing it. And I'm sitting here working in a in a factory. I'm a janitor. So he gave up his job. He said, like, you know what? I'm going to go live in my car uh, if I don't make enough money. And that's what he did. He's like, I got a paid off car. He lived in his car for three years. And it sounds so easy now. Oh, three years? No, dude, do you understand? Three years is month after month after month after month after mm. month, 36 times. Mm. Yeah, and he's just going up to showing up to events, eating whatever food they got, showering at gyms, showering where like if he's got a hotel, he'd ask for you know extra late checkout. That way he can spend an extra day on a bed, and it's just like man, like like there's the opportunities there. Success isn't everything, but it's like dude, if you have a dream, you can you can do what you want. But sometimes you just need a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of guidance. And for me, it's like look, man, like life is short, make it worthwhile. Yeah. So <clears throat> our audience, um, you know, yeah, we're, we're kind of like um, tied to dance culture, right? Like the um, even where Ken just started, we started as just a dance crew. And then, you know, we kind of evolved into a business, into a brand, into an idea. Yeah, you guys are into, killing it, man. Thank, thank you. you man. Thank you. And, and, you know, but like, you know, we're, we're not in our 20s anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean, like we we've definitely learned that. Um, if we want to keep this thing going, we have to shift um, our mindset. You yeah. know, like it all starts with the mind, as you you you've mentioned a lot. Um, so you you term uh, this 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 term minority mindset. Uh, everybody and us included can think like, what does that mean? Oh, because we're all minorities, and this is like how we think. Like, no, like I know you have a very um, you know specific way that you you uh, define that. Um, so one, can you talk first about why is mindset so important in terms of everything that we've been talking about, right? In terms of like carving out your future, uh, making plans, making goals and purpose and all that, like it all starts up here. So uh, can you talk a little bit about why you think mindset is the first place where everything starts from? And then can you also explain what minority mindset means? So let me actually start with the second one. It'll be easier to explain. So minority mindset. It's the, it's the mindset of thinking differently than the majority of people. So it's all about a mindset and it's not really the way you look because anybody can have that minority mindset. It's just about thinking differently. Now, why is that important? Why is your mindset so important? I say, look, all success starts with your mindset. If you believe you can do it, it doesn't mean you're going to do it, but it means you possibly could do it. Yeah. Mm. And if you tell yourself, I can't do something, I guarantee you, you won't be able to do it. Like, it's just a fact. And... 
that's the thing that differentiates somebody who becomes successful and who doesn't is I believe I can do it. Mm -hmm. And it, it might be completely outrageous. Like what I say is like, I've always been known as the guy that when I do something, I want to be called stupid. Like uh, it, it's a stupid idea. And that's a stupid idea that then becomes a good idea. But I was stupid enough to believe in myself. And, you know, looking back, yeah, I get it. I get why people call me stupid. Like, I, I was doing a bunch of dumb things. I made a lot of mistakes. I did a lot of things wrong. But it's how you learn. And you got to be willing to be crazy enough to believe in yourself. And it it only makes sense when you look back at it. When you're trying to do it, it just seems like the whole world is just imploding. Everything is going wrong. And that mindset of, like, it doesn't matter. You're just going to do it. And it's easier if you have a good environment around you. Like, I was lucky. Like, I talked to my, my business partner, right? My boy. Like, literally, it was me and, like, two other dudes. We were all in our uh, same age. So, we started getting together when we were, like, in our teenage years. They were all DJs. They were all kind of, like, outcasts as well. We were all kind of just doing our own thing. And we didn't know what we wanted. We didn't know how to do it. We just knew we wanted to become successful. All of our parents were, like, go do something, like, normal. And we were, like, no, we want to do our own thing. So, we were just kind of, like, had our own group. We were, like, really close friends. We hung out all the time. When one of us would get kicked out of the house, we'd go to the other person's house and sleep in the basement over there. So it was, like, one of those, like, we were just cool. And I think that was really helpful for me, especially in the early stages, because, like, we would just talk about all, like, the things that were going on. And we are like, yeah, man, one day we're going to make it big. One day we're going to do something. And, you know, we didn't know what we were going to do. And we all kind of did different things. But now we kind of look back and we're like, man, I don't know why we were doing the things that we did, but you know, somehow it worked out. And I think that's the important thing is like, you need that constant reminder for you. Yeah. And if you can't get it from your friends, if you can't get it from your family, do it with books. If you can't get it from books, watch YouTube videos. And now there's like a lot of online forums, which weren't there 10 years ago. Put yourself in an environment where you're like around people that want to do something big. Cause mm -hmm. when you're constantly around that, like, especially the man, when, you, when you're like a, in an immigrant family, you got a lot of judgments and a lot of expectations and, and that whole thing of like people like the family orientation, the way that, you know, your aunts are going to be talking about you, the way that random people are going to be saying things about you. It's just like, it really can dampen the way that you look at things. And that's where you got to just kind of like, either you got to be tough enough to say, screw you, I'm going to do whatever I want. Or you got to give yourself like a place where you can go and, and, and have that kind of support yeah. to get it. So like, um, let's say there's somebody out there who might be listening or watching right now that doesn't feel like um, they're as um, smart or as uh, privileged or in a position that they're like, yo, I don't have access to, um, you know, these books or, um, you know, the people that you have access to. So if like, if I'm starting out from scratch, Right. And like, I'm like, okay, fine. Like I, now I'm learning about, I just learned the word investing today. Like, yeah. how do I start? I got, I got, I make like a hundred bucks a week, you know, like, like if we were to go to like the base level, cause I feel like you, you are somebody who figured it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I know there's a lot of people out there, especially given the, the current socioeconomic climate, we're in a recession, just kind of, you know, climbing out yeah. of this pandemic. You know, and there's a lot of just like fear I feel yeah. out, out there, like, right, like the markets are down, like this is the worst time to invest into yada, yada, yada. So if I'm in a place where I'm at this place, I'm like, I'm only making like a hundred dollars a week, a couple hundred dollars a week. I, I don't have the education. I don't have the resources. And I'm listening to this podcast for the first time. What sort of advice would you give that person who's like, yo, I'm starting at like ground zero. Yeah. Can I make my way out of this? Like what, what sort yeah. of advice would you give to that person? So let me start with like the actual practical advice of like, here's what you can start doing right now. And then more of like a theoretical, if you want to do something bigger, what can you do? So if you want to just start investing your money, here's the, the reality. The stock market historically has grown by around 10% a year for the last century. That doesn't mean it goes up by 10% every year. It means on average, if you look at it over the long term, it grows by 10% a year. But... Most people statistically lose money in the stock market. Now, when you look at those two things, how does that make any sense? Well, it's because most people who try to put their money in the market don't know the actual ins and outs of investing, and they don't have the psychology of knowing how to hold or buy or sell. And so most people end up losing. So the first thing is now understanding, okay, if I want to invest my money in the market, and I don't want to be like an investor, like I don't want to research companies, I don't want to study the financials, I don't even know how, no big deal. 
There are things that you can do. There are funds that you can invest in that will give you exposure to the stock market without you having to put in the work. So what does that mean? So there are funds. One example, one type of fund is called an ETF. There's a couple others. One's called an index fund. One's called a mutual fund. But I'll talk about ETFs because they're probably the most accessible and easy to use. ETFs stand for exchange traded fund. And when you invest in an ETF, you're investing in a group of companies. So invest instead of investing in the Amazon company, you can invest in a fund that gives you exposure to Amazon and 499 other companies. So when you invest in this one fund, you're investing in a whole bunch of companies. So now you don't have to worry about like that risk of that mm -hmm. one company going down to zero. Now what you do is you can look for a few funds. I'll we'll give you a few examples. I'm not telling you what to invest in, but just a few examples. VTI is a fund that gives you exposure to the total stock market. So when they say invest in the stock market, VTI will give you exposure to the total United States stock market. SPY is a fund that gives you exposure to the S&P 500, which is a group of the biggest 500 companies in the stock market. DIA is a fund that gives you exposure to the 30 companies in the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones is, if you ever heard of people talking about the stock market, they're probably talking about the Dow Jones. That is the most commonly referred to group of companies that give you an idea what's happening in the market. And then if you want to invest in the NASDAQ, which is the 100 companies, largest companies in the stock market that are not financial. So a lot of these are tech companies. QQQ is a fund that gives you exposure to that. Now, again, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just some examples. So now when you invest in any one of those things, you're getting exposure to all those companies. The next thing is now, how do you invest? Because if you want to be this type of investor, you don't want to just take $100 and put it in and never do that again, because that's not enough money. So what you need to do now is build a system. And there's a lot of platforms online that will automate this for you. But you want to build a system where you're going to automatically, passively, and consistently invest. So that means take whatever money you can, come up with a number for a week, whether it's $10 a week, $100 a week, doesn't matter. Take some amount of money, either every week or every two weeks, or at the least every month. Have it automatically pulled out of your checkings account and invested into one of these or some of these funds. You can pick whichever funds you want. And now, no matter what's happening in the market, whether you're in a recession, a market crash, or a boom, you continue to do this. Because the biggest mistake people make is that when you see the market go down, they stop buying or they start selling. That's not what you want to be doing. More millionaires are made during market crashes and recessions than any other time because that's when these assets, these investments go on sale. So the only change that you'd be doing is investing more because what you're doing now when you invest in these funds is you're literally marrying these funds. You want to be investing for at least the next decade. If you're not investing for the next decade, then you shouldn't even start like this. And so understand that going in. And then if you see the markets crash, you see your investment portfolio go down 50%. You don't sell. You keep doing it and you hold on. And it's it, this is hard and it's easy to say, oh, okay, that makes sense. But when you see your investment portfolio go from 10 grand to $5,000, that's where now people start to panic. Mm -hmm. But this is where you got to remember, you're not investing for two months. You're not investing for two years. You're investing for 20 years. So what's happening with the short term, you don't change. You just keep investing. And if anything, you invest more. And if you stick with that, the numbers historically have told us that you will make more money especially if investing in these types of funds. And that's where historically the stock market has grown. And if you believe that America is still going to be a strong economy in 20 years, you just keep sticking with this. If you think America is, is uh, going to be the 10th country in the world and you don't think America is a place to invest, then maybe you invest in emerging market ETFs. There's there are, Now you can invest in ETFs that have exposure to companies and countries overseas. You can do both. Right, So now it's just understanding what is it that you want to invest in. You build a system, now you don't have to worry about it and you don't even have to stress. You just keep doing it every week. So I would say that's kind of like, here's where you start for anyone. You know what's crazy? That's, that's especially at my age now, I'm, I'm you know 36 now. And I hear that, I'm like, absolutely, yep, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I, I'm ashamed to say that it probably took me like six, seven years to learn that on mm -hmm. my own through different things. But that's a lot quicker than most people, man. So uh, that's you know, the thing. I'm a lot quicker than you hear you're, that. You're a fast learner. <laughs> you hear that, mom? Yeah, you're well, a fast so, learner. Like, it, it seems like um, you have like a formula for this, right? There is a formula. Like, and I'm going to go back to the guy who's making $100 a week, right? Or uh, it, So whatever that dollar amount is, um, I think what I'm getting from you is a mindset, a discipline, and consistency. Yeah. And then, you know, compound that over time, then yeah. you'll see the results that you you want to see. 
Um, do you have a formula for that? Like, let's say I'm making a, if I'm making a hundred dollars a week, like how much percentage of my hundred dollars should I be investing, saving, um, and spending? Good question, man. So yeah, I like to say a general rule of thumb is at the bare minimum, what you want to strive for is 75, 15, 10, which means for every dollar that you earn, 75 cents is the max you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum you should be investing. 10 cents is the minimum you're saving. Start with that goal. If you can't do it tomorrow, work towards that. Once you get there, then you can decide if you want to stick there, if you want to be more aggressive with your investing. Your investing is what will make you wealthier. Your savings are what protect you when things go wrong. And your spending is what you can use to buy your Gucci. So it's, you, know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you, you got to kind of make sure that you're always paying yourself first. Uh, but mm. this is where now you always are putting some money aside to invest no matter what. And that's where that discipline comes in. And that's why I say automate it. Because if you automate it, you don't got to have as much discipline. Mm. It's You don't even see the money. Totally. It's right, just being put right. out. And you just, just got to make sure you don't yep. touch it. So that's where that, you know, that real like the automation is so important. Because if you do it manually, you're going to forget. You're going to want to buy something new. Right. You're going to want to. There's a lot of emotional. Like, yeah. Like, yeah so that, just that take the emotion out and just automate the whole thing. And mm-hmm. are you a person that's like, uh, Take your investments, let's say you're in a more capable position to like, you know, uh, kind of have a more diverse portfolio, so to speak. Are you somebody who's like, same thing, take that same mindset and mentality and discipline and automation and put that in varying markets? Or are you like, mm. start at this one? If Because if you can get this one good, then you've created a passive engine that might be able to fund this one. And this right, is a little right, bit more of a right. risky thing there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'll talk about me because I think everybody is different in how involved they want to yeah. be. Because... You know, the, the general rule is when you do one thing and you can build one thing, then that can fund the second and third. But you also want to kind of be an opportunist, at least for me. Like I started uh, in real estate and that's all I did. I was like, I'm not investing my money in the stock market. Why would I want to do that? That's stupid. And so I was just buying real estate. I made money for one reason only. I made money to buy real estate. Not for me to live in, but for me to rent out. And that's the only thing that I did. Like I was, I had, my shoes had holes in them. I was like, <laughs> just not spending money on going out to eat. I was not going on vacations. I was just like, dude, I'm going to, I'm going to buy more real estate. And then I started to change a little bit as prices became more expensive. And I was like, Oh, okay. The opportunity isn't here. Like it was, where can I find the next opportunity? So then I put money into the stock market. And then I was like, I could have even better returns if I put this money into my own business. So then I put more money into my own business. And that's where, you know, you can have higher returns, but more risk. My business can go bankrupt tomorrow. Yeah. And, I lose everything that I put in. When I have real estate, at least I have land. I have the bricks with my business. What do I got? And that's where, you know, I can get better returns, more risk. And so it's, where is that opportunity for you? Because people, now I, I get the slot where people will say, dude, how am I supposed to start? You started when real estate was so cheap. It was easier. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it was the opportunity at the time. Most, but, a lot, you know, I will also say a lot of people had more money than I did then, but mm-hmm. they weren't buying. And this is now understanding you need the opportunity and the education. So where is that next opportunity going to be? And this is where you just pay attention to what's around you. If you see opportunities in the stock market, take it. If you see opportunities in real estate, take it. Maybe it's in cryptocurrency. Maybe it's in artificial intelligence. Maybe it's in your own business idea. Maybe it's in something else. Like And everybody's opportunities are different. And just finding what's right for you will allow you to kind of really capitalize on it and, and grow. And don't expect that whatever you do next is going to be like that this is what I have to do and it's going to be right. Like I think most people, you screw up a lot of times and you, and then that's how you figure out what is going to be right. Mm. But you got to be willing to go through that. How would you advise somebody? Because we're talking now about like risk tolerance, right? Like We don't know what's going to be the next <laughs> thing that pops, right? Yeah. Whether it's crypto, real estate, whatever. Um, how would you, and not asking for financial advice, but how would you advise somebody who's like, okay, well, how do I figure out what I should do? be paying attention to um in terms of like yeah is it crypto is it real estate is it stocks is it my own business is it nfts like yeah you know like if for the average joe who doesn't know because i think there's a lot like a lot of our probably audience may be like man this is just all like brand new information yeah. or maybe people are just like are, are kind of getting privy to this and they're curious for somebody who's kind of uh, figured it out for themselves. And, and you know, like you said, you you just said, like, it, for me, it was it was real estate because at that time it was what worked out. Yeah. And then you've kind of been paying attention to different things. So, like, given there's so much 
noise out there. There's so much yeah. that you can be distracted by that could be so overwhelming. It's like, oh, I don't even know what to do, so I'm not gonna do anything. If you were to just be like, you know what? Like, forget all the 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 shiny yeah. Yeah. objects. Yeah. Um, like if you want to be safe and start with like A before yeah. we even think about getting to B, like is there is there something that is like this is the safe thing to like start with? What what would you say about that? The safe thing, I mean, if you want just the safe thing, I would say put the money into the markets that we just talked about. Put it into like the S and P five hundred, into the total stock market, and just keep doing that for. The and we're talking time. about a long play here, long term, yeah, right, yeah. But then you know the safe play can also hurt you in the sense that you you miss out on potential other bigger and better opportunities. Mm. So now, how much risk are you willing to take? This is gonna look at now where are you in life? If you're young, you like, do I want to? I want to take more risks, I can afford more risks, I want to do something big. Okay, then where is that? Well, maybe it's in your own business. Uh, and this is really now also one, like what you were saying, 100%, ignore the noise. If everybody is doing something, don't do it. More 99% mm. of the time. Because if everyone's doing it, then <laughs> there's probably something going on there. And so like when you hear people talking about how everything is so good in a meme stock, you already missed it. Mm. If you're doing it after everyone's talked about it, if it's hit the news, you already missed it. So you want to find something that it hasn't hit the mainstream yet. If you want to find that type of higher risk, higher potential opportunity, what is that? I don't know. And that's where you know you got to figure out what is right for you. It's like someone asking, what business should I start? I don't know. Mm. Uh, what do you like? Where can you, like, where do you find someone's pain and where can you solve that pain? Where, where can you solve a problem? How can you make something better? And that's the real kind of like, you got to discover that for yourself. And you don't know if you don't know where to start, but you want to read books. Like that was what really helped me. And I would say like, you get an MBA level education just by reading books. Start by reading books on like entrepreneur biographies, read people that you like, people who you look up to, who you think are successful, read their biographies, read five books on starting a business, read five books on how to scale a business, read five books on money management and investing. Then read five books on how to manage people, how to manage the business itself. If you read those 25 books over the course of a year, you are going to know so much more in 12 months about money, business, and that will help you then make the decision because you're just more knowledgeable. So start by learning. Just absorb content if you don't know anything. Just learn yourself. And that's the place where you can put money too. I love that. So we had some fun, obviously, talking about like, you know, the the new investor that maybe doesn't have all the answers and is getting like, you know, from very foundational knowledge. But just for fun, um, you're obviously you've been in the game for a long time. You've made, you know, obviously a lot of success and financial freedom for yourself. What investment plays are you making nowadays? All right. So I invest my money in five places. Uh, I invest it into my own business and startups. So I have three companies now. I have Briefs Media which is my news at our company. So if anybody wants to stay up to date on what's happening in the financial news or you have a business idea, we have newsletters for you. Like my Market Briefs newsletter, that's one of the newsletters for investors. It's free. It's a daily breakdown of what's happening in the financial markets. Uh, my Business Briefs newsletter is a breakdown of the latest business trends, innovation trends, and what's happening. So this is catered for entrepreneurs. That's at briefs.co. Then I have Market Insiders which is our financial education platform. This is a paid subscription service where now you get access to classes, you get coaching on the app, you get access to the community. It's an actual like mobile app, um, or you can do it on the computer, marketinsiders.com. But this is where now you can go to learn more education. And then I have Buzz Legal, which is my, it's funny, I started a law firm. I don't work as an attorney, <laughs> but I have a network of attorneys that I work with. So like, let's say you have a business idea, you want to trademark it, or you need a patent, or you have a copyright that you want to do. Uh, we can refer you to an attorney that can help you with that. And we have a good network of people that can do that. So that's that. So now my biggest investment is into my own business ideas. So now when we're trying to grow one of these companies, I'm taking cash and I'm putting it into this. That way I can grow the business um, this might be hiring more employees. This might be advertising. This might be doing a marketing campaign. This might be new softwares, new things to grow these businesses. Uh, I also invest in some startups. It's in the same business realm, um, but that's smaller, kind of more, much more risky, but more fun because I like working with entrepreneurs. Second is real estate. Uh, I I like real estate because it gives you the cash flow. There's a lot of uh, tax benefits to investing in real estate, and you own a hard asset, something that you can see, feel, and touch. 
Third is stocks. Stocks, because it's accessible, it's a way to get exposure to the economy. And I invest in stocks passively, like we talked about. I also individually invest in companies. Fourth would be crypto. This is more on like the speculative side, a smaller piece of my portfolio. I have a, again, this is passive, where I invest in a little bit of Bitcoin, a little bit of Ethereum, and a couple other coins every day. And it's not a lot of money. It's a small piece of my portfolio. So if this went to zero, I'm okay. It's, it's speculative, but I believe in the blockchain for the long term. And then 2% of my portfolio is physical gold. Again, this is like every month I just buy a little bit of gold. It's on autopilot. This is like my doomsday insurance. Like it's, it's a savings. <laughs> I, this is not like, I don't really care what's happening with the price of gold. If everything goes wrong, the world is ending and the dollar goes to crap. Uh, I imagine that gold would then kind of come back as the reserve currency of the world. So that's why it's on gold. It's like mm. insurance. It's just yeah. a zombie underage. apocalypse. Zombie yeah. apocalypse. I believe insurance. in that. I believe in that. So you're talking about um, automating certain things, um, which dollar cost averaging. Yeah. Right. So can you explain what dollar cost averaging is? So dollar cost averaging is what we were just talking about, where it's you have an automatic system. You're consistently, passively, and automatically buying something. So you are, the markets go like this. And so now, instead of knowing exactly when to buy, because nobody knows the perfect time to buy, no one can perfectly time the market, the people that do try to time the market end up either paying too much or, or selling too low because you're trying to perfectly time. But instead of doing that, you just set up the system where let's just say every week you're buying. Now, when the markets go like this, you have some to buy here, some to buy here, some to buy here, and then you kind of average out to you know wherever your buys are, but now you just keep buying more and anytime you get paid, you just keep buying more. Mm -hmm. And so you could do that easily in the stock market. You could do it with crypto. You could do it with gold. With real estate, it's a little bit tougher, but now there are funds that let you do that too. So you're not buying the property yourself. You're investing in a fund that gives you exposure to real estate. But it's a, like if you want to be a passive investor, you don't want to have to worry about it. You just want to put a little bit of money to work so you're building some wealth while you're doing whatever else you're doing. It's fine. That's when you set up these types of dollar cost average systems. Now it's passive. You don't got to worry about it. At least start with that. And that's like kind of going back to like the whole purpose. It's like we, everybody should at least be doing that. And if you're not, you're really shooting yourself in the foot because then eventually you're going to get to a point and you're going to say, I worked all these years. I put in all this time. I made all this money. What do I have to show for it? I got a car with payments. I got a house with payments. I got kids with payments. <laughs> I got, But I got nothing else. Right. And, and now it's like, how do you have the payments coming in mm. rather than going out. Right. And that's right. that mindset shift that, you know, it's like you got to be a little bit inspired and know that that's possible. That way you start learning about how do you actually do it. Yeah. Speaking of payments, um, debt, right? When, when we buy a car, we finance something, uh, we're, we're essentially like paying a certain amount. We're in debt to a bank, company, whatever that is. Um, and so obviously debt sounds negative in, in people's minds, like I owe, and then there's interest that I owe. Um, can you break down in your mind, um, is there such thing as good debt versus bad debt? And then if so, what do you consider good debt and what do you consider bad debt? So on, on debt, for most people, debt means I have credit card debt, I got car payments, I got student loans. And most of these things aren't putting any money in your pocket. And that's where debt becomes bad because now you're spending... Debt by itself is I'm spending tomorrow's income today. Then I got to pay it back plus interest. So if you're spending tomorrow's income and all of next year's income to buy that purse, well, you're going to have to pay that purse back with tomorrow's income and more. So that's what debt is. So for regular expenses, these liabilities, the things that don't make you any money, when you go into debt to buy them, you are not only spending more than you would have, but now you also got to pay that money back plus interest. So never finance anything that's not going to pay you like that, with the exception being your home. Now, if you are going to go out and buy something that makes you money, now what's going on here? Well, I'm going to buy this thing with tomorrow's income, but this thing is going to pay me back. That means this thing is going to pay for the debt itself. Mm. And if you can do that now, you're using tomorrow's income to buy something that's going to pay you and pay for the payments. And so now you've just created a new stream of income. Like this could be like a rental property. And if you can find a good deal, 
which is harder now with interest rates going higher, but it, you know, it's like being patient. If you can find a deal where you can buy a property and now the tenant is paying rent, they're paying expenses and that covers your expenses. Now your expenses are covered. Your mortgage is covered and it's putting some money in your pocket. Now you're using your debt to make money as opposed to make somebody else rich. And that's the complete, that's, I mean, that's where it would become okay. But of course you want to be smart with it because you can go way overboard and you can take on too much debt and more debt just means more headache. And for some people, it can make a lot of people really, it can make some people really rich. It can make some people lose everything. And now it's like, how much headache do you want to deal with? And just kind of knowing that and being willing to manage that. And this is a mistake a lot of people make in the stock market because they don't realize that margin means debt. So when you go to a stock brokerage account, many brokerages are going to say, hey, you qualify for $5,000 of margin. And you say, oh, what is that? Because that's what I did. I didn't know margin was debt. So I started trading that money. And then I found out that it was debt. So I stopped trading that money. And then three, four months later, I get a bill saying I owe interest on it. I'm like, I haven't even touched this money. Why do I owe, owe this? So I called up the brokerage and they were like, well, it's in your account. You have access to it. So you have to pay interest on it. I was like, turn that off, <laughs> right? And, <Yeah>. and, and <laughs> that's where it's like understanding there's a cost to debt mm -hmm. and it can make you more money. It can also lose you more money. So first build the experience before you go out and kind of use a whole bunch of debt is what I would say. Yeah, I mean, dude, <laughs> I have like so many more questions, but for the sake of time, man, like, uh, you know, I think we could probably maybe hopefully get you back another time. But I think like um, big question that I would have and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, thinking from, you know, uh, from our listener standpoint, even from ourselves, you know, like money is a constantly it's it's in our minds daily, right? You know, mm -hmm. we wake up thinking about how we're going to make our money today, how we're going to make our time valuable. People say time is money. Like it's so prevalent, right? And it could get overwhelming. It can get stressful. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so many relationships um, struggle over financial issues and yeah. agreement on things like that. Um, for yourself, like on a human standpoint, because I, you know, as you're talking, I'm like, bro, this guy just like, it's like a well of knowledge. And I'm just thinking like, man, this guy's just like constantly thinking about this stuff. Like, is there a point or like where you shut that side off where you kind of like, I need to just not think about business. I need to not think about like, how oh, do man. you, how do you unwind? How do you like take care of your, yourself? Cause you talked about the four things you talk about physical, you talk about mental, you talk about uh spiritual and financial, but like, you know, let, let's, let's even go to the, the, the mental side of things. Right. If you're constantly just in one, one track mind about anything, we can get so off balance. Yeah. Is there a side of you that, um, that really focuses on like, let me just shut things out. You, you, you're married. I'm married. Yeah. Any kids? No kids. No yet. kids. Okay. Yeah. How old are you? I'm 31. 31. Okay. So like you're married, no kids. Um, but you know, yeah, you, you have to, you know, tend to your, your marriage, your wife. 100%. And so how do you, um, cause again, I'm, 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 I'm like, like, I'm yeah, over dude. here. Like I want to take down no, notes, sure. but, but I'm like, damn dude, there's gotta be a point where you're just like, Whew, all right, let me, I'm done for the day. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what, what does that look like for you? And, and that's a hard question to answer because like, even for me, like I, I work a lot and the definition of work changes like in different phases of your career. Like for me in the beginning, work meant I had to go somewhere, bust my butt. Like when I was working at weddings, I was playing the drum, but I was also like lifting the speakers. I was setting up the DJ equipment, setting up everything. So I was like going there, carrying stuff. I see this finger how it's broken because I dropped a, a speaker on it. So Damn. like, <laughs> no, you go through that that phase of work. Then it's more of like, okay, now work can be more thinking, and I could be in a jacuzzi thinking I'm working right, and yeah, that level that so the work changes, and so now it's like I go out to dinner and I'm working because I'm talking to somebody and we're talking business. Now when do I turn that off? Especially when you're like you got married, you got families, you, you got things to do, and it is tough in the sense of like when you have a business work is always on your mind because the business doesn't turn off and i think that for me was like a big conversation with my wife before we were married like knowing like hey i'm an entrepreneur and i'm not like most people like work is is my life it's what i do and 
it's even more than work because like for me it's not just for the money it's for the the purpose right and so it's like this is what i do this is what i live and i breathe this this is me and uh so she understood that before we married and now still you, you gotta like have times where we don't talk about work and we go and go on a date but we still end up talking about work half the time. But it's like, <laughs> is your wife an entrepreneur? Too? She she's getting into entrepreneurship now. Um, nice. But she she's become like I think it's kind of like one of those things where it took it took time for us to build a relationship to really understand like, okay, it's okay to talk about work, and now she kind of encourages it more too, and she likes it way more now than before. So it's kind of like a a learning process where we had to kind of figure it out together. Um, before I used to also turn down. A lot of things like I used to be very obsessed with like, I'm like, I'm not spending money. I'm not going to waste time. So I, I didn't never went on a vacation unless I was getting paid. Like I, unless somebody was getting married somewhere else and they were going to pay me to go there. I wasn't traveling <laughs> unless uh, somebody was paying for the meal. I'm not going out to eat. Like I'd go out to the restaurant. And I'm going to drink water. That's it. And I also like I turned on a lot of uh, hanging out with my friends. I turned down going out and like doing a lot of that stuff. And over the last few years, especially, like, I was like, okay, look, I am doing okay. Like, what do I want to be? Like, do I want to just have a lot of money or do I want to live a full life? And I was like, you know what? I Having that kind of balanced life now is, is better for me. But I went through a lot of imbalance to have much more balance. Like, I went through that phase where, like, yeah. dude, I, I put it all in where I didn't spend money and I didn't spend time. It was just me growing it. And now I have a little, I'm, I'm fortunate to have more freedom in that like, hey, I can go out on a, on a trip with my friends if I wanted to. And it's not going to affect me. And I know the business is going to be okay. And I know that I can, I can hang out with my cousins. I can go hang out with my friends. I can go and do other things. I can go out and do more. So that freedom is is definitely there. Like I, I have way more freedom now. I still work a lot. Like I, I work around the clock. Uh, but if I wanted to like not work, I have that freedom. And if I'm not doing something else, like I don't watch Netflix, you know what I'm saying? Like my wife likes Netflix. If my wife and I, she's like, Hey, let's watch a Netflix thing. She's going to put it on. I'm going to fall asleep. Like, yeah, it's one, yeah, yeah. I just like, for me, it's like, I'm going to, it's just an opportunity for me to take a nap. I'm just not interested in that. <laughs> but you know, it's like, mm-hmm. you gotta have, I'm very fortunate. I have a good partner, man. And yeah. she's been supportive of it all. And I think that helps a lot. And I think for me, it's, it doesn't mean that it, it starts like that. Because if you're hearing this say, man, my wife doesn't like when I work so much. Man, look, I get it. You got to like, it, it was like a process where mm. I had to talk to her. We had to kind of come up with a balance and figure, and she had to understand me. And we had to kind of figure it out. And it's like one of those things that, you know, we don't have a rule book on how to do it either. You know, you got to figure it out and how you're going to manage all these relationships and what's important to you. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that even answered your question. No, no, that, really that makes does. a lot of sense. Yeah. Thanks for sharing too, because you know I know that that's um, how you personally, you know, are with with your mentality and like how you're doing stuff. And I love the the visual of you thinking about your business while you're sitting in a jacuzzi. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, like that's kind of like the dream, right? People want to be successful. People want to. It's not that you want to like hella retire quick. It's like you want to have purpose and like do yeah. something. You just want to do it well. You want to do it, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a healthy terms, space. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, I I just want to take a moment as we're closing this up too, to, I was just thinking about it. Like it's such a important thing to like, have you come on our pod. And it's like, it means a lot because like when, when we even think about, you know, our community, where we came from, why we're even doing this podcast and the, and the place that we grew from, like in our dance culture and stuff. Oh my God. Like I, I can't, imagine how many times where i could have been like passively investing in something but i needed to go get those new nikes or i needed to like flaunt to go judge this event or i needed to buy this like collab jacket just because i know that nobody else would have it and it's fresh as freak even though like the fashion is very very quick and it's probably not going to be in season for like you know evergreen like that for a couple years you know but you wouldn't think twice on those things. And I know how many dancers that I've had to like mentor in in general over the last decade, you know what I mean? To uh, people that are listening right now that it's like same thing. If you could just take, you know, 50 bucks a week or something like that, that stuff that you normally casually spend on coffee or on, 
you know, whatever nonsense it is that you are just into when you're younger, like you would put yourself in a completely different position at like, you know, where we're at in our age right now yeah. to even just hit your thirties and have systems set up because you tried, like if even one listener you know what I mean? Yeah. From this pod is able to do that. That's a life change because yeah. I know what that yeah. feels like and I know what it feels like to be a little bit late on it mm -hmm. and to wish I would have started earlier that I could have so clearly now that I'm more mature made such different choices. You know what I mean? Yeah, so to yeah. have you come on and, and you know, if it may be too late for some of us, but like, <laughs> you know, for some younger minds that are listening to this yeah. stuff right now, if only they would listen because you're right. We don't get taught these very basic concepts. Man. We don't have these like... um clear like this is how you do this and it's not up to especially many of our immigrant parents yeah. to be educated on yeah. these platforms or these new technologies or these spaces and, and entryways to get into investing especially in america you know what i mean that it's like to just hear the simplicity of how you're putting things out right now i just hope younger dancers especially you know what i mean people yeah. that like we this is where we came from would listen to some of this advice because I, I would have for sure taken it if I was younger, if somebody could just hand those keys to knowledge and mm -hmm. information on a silver platter, like I feel like we're talking about today, yeah. you know? So whoever's out there just straight up, like this is gonna be one of probably the, the podcast that I'm gonna think is actually the most valuable of all the conversations we sat down. <laughs> no matter how like yeah. elementary it, it kind of is, I'm sure for you, you know what I mean? Um, but thank you so much for coming no, because man, I believe yeah. the people that need to hear this are people that listen to our pod. I appreciate that, man. And if I can add to that, cause I, I, I get it, man. Cause I was, you know, in the entertainment business, it's kind of similar. It's all about the show. And I was all about that. When I first started making money, my money only went to one place, my car. <laughs> I, I, and, 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 and that's what I did, man. Like I, I had a Toyota, and the first thing I did was I upgraded the rims. Then I put in the subs. Toyota in the car. what though? What Solara, you? man. Oh, I, oh, okay, let's go. rims on the so, Solara. Yeah. The rims on the Solara. I put the subs on it. Then I put the HIDs on it. Then I put the tints on it. Then I upgraded the sound system, and it was nice. Then I went to go put on Lamborghini doors on my Toyota because I found a guy that I could do it. And you so, put Lamborghini well, doors <laughs> on your Toyota. No, no. So level, I saved dude. up the money to do it. I saved up thirty five hundred dollars because I found a good. I started calling around to find somebody who could do it. I found somebody who could do it. And I wanted a custom one that I could switch from Lamborghini doors to regular doors. Wow. And so I wanted to get it. And so I found out it was $3,500. And so I saved up $3,500. I called up my cousin. I was like, yo, guess what I'm about to do? He was like, what? I was I'm about to put Lamborghini doors on my car. And the first thing he says is, you're so stupid. And, and, and he, man, he knocked some sense into me because like, I was cousin. literally, I was like this close. I was about to go and do it. I even scheduled the appointment and he sat there on the phone with me. He's like, dude, I promise you this is a bad decision. Don't do it. And see, he didn't go off the phone until I, until I said, no, I'm not going to do it. But, I, you know, you go through that phase and until something hits you, yeah. you're like, oh my God, my car isn't doing anything for me. You got to like kind of, I went the complete opposite end. Then. Like I went like, I'm, I went cheap, cheap, cheap. Like, yeah. There's a difference between cheap and frugal. I went cheap. And I went like, I was not spending money on anything and that's not healthy either but it was a way for me to realize i gotta make up for the the stupid things that i did before you know <laughs> right, what i mean so offset. yeah yeah so i get it man and, and it's okay to do that mm. now it's like when you learn it now you got to make the decision right yeah right right well dude in light of everything man again we could we could go for hours with you and you know you have so much to drop on us but like we love to ask every one of our guests um, their their view and their definition of what success means. Um, so that can be tied in with career, that can be tied in with your relational, you know, health, your personal health, and all that. Uh, what would you, in your current state right now, how would you define success? Success is making the world a better place. You doing something that makes the world better, and what I love about that is. When you are passionate, because what you're passionate about is different than what I'm passionate about. And so when you can go out and do something that makes the world better for you, you are seeing that success. And the the reason why I say it like that is because somebody's going to be passionate about world hunger. Somebody's going to be passionate about AIDS. Somebody's going to be passionate about uh, something else. And people will criticize you for it, but that success is now focusing on what's important to you and going to help out. Like I created a, uh, co-founded this community service organization. And one of the things that we do is we uh, feed people in Detroit, homeless people. 
and we get criticism. People will say, why are you guys fighting this homeless uh, food problem when you could be given the fighting the drug problem? And it's like, look, you got these people sitting at home complaining on their sofa about how you're changing the world. But look, your success is you finding what's important to you and making that difference because everyone's got a mouth and everyone's going to be able to run it. But only some people are going to actually do something about what's important to them. And that's what real success is. Yeah, man. Mm. Heck yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Love that. Do we got time for a lightning? Yeah, we got time for we a lightning. We got time man. for lightning. All right, cool. Well, then, you know, in classic uh, movement in the shadows uh, format, we do a little lightning round with uh, just some quick fire questions at you. And uh, we're going to just come quick with it. So, lightning in three, two, one. What's your favorite fast food restaurant? Oh, Chipotle. What was the last biggest financial splurge you made for yourself? Oh, vacation to uh, Jamaica. What is your most prized possession? My wife. Well, it's not a possession, right? You can't <laughs> yeah, say that possession. Oh. But that was lightning, bro. It came off the top of your head. <laughs> it's my most prized thing. Yes. It okay. Is, is. Uh, most influential person in your life? My grandfather. What's the next business venture that you're going towards? Growing what I have right now, man. And I make the mistake of trying to do too many things, so now I'm focusing. I hear that. You mentioned uh, five categories of, of books. Uh, what would those five top books uh, that you would recommend for people? All right, to number read? one, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Number two, balance that out with a total money makeover by Dave Ramsey. Uh, number three, read, uh, what would be a good third one? Read The Creature from Jekyll Island if you want to learn about how money works. Number four, read How to Build a Sellable Business to learn about building a real scalable business. Number five would be uh, read a book about a biography. One of my favorites is uh, the what was his name? Uh, the guy that created CNN. I don't care if you're a liberal or Republican. <laughs> his book is crazy and amazing and inspirational. Nice. Uh, I forgot his book, unfortunately, but yeah, read that we'll, book. We'll, we'll find it and we'll yeah. plug it in the notes. What is, uh, if you can list just very quickly, what is the uh, biggest financial gain that you made in an investment and the biggest financial loss that you made in an investment the biggest financial loss that i made in an investment if, if we talk that's like well my worst real estate investment deal is my worst like traditional loss because it's the only deal i lost money on in real estate i made a video on youtube but i would say in terms of dollar figures it would probably be in my own business uh because everyone's talked this is like a few years ago where everyone would say oh if you do this this and this you can build a blog that makes money and i was really busy with a bunch of other things so I was like, okay, let's do that. So we hired 12 freelance writers for the blog. I hired some staff to manage the blog. And I hired like this top, top, top consulting team to manage our blog to help grow it. Because I was like, I don't got the time. I'll hire the best people. I spent half a million dollars on the blog. We made like two grand from it. And I was like, all right, uh, that was a complete waste. Uh, so that was a total loss. Your The next one was the best gain. Yeah. Uh, the probably a real estate deal that I made. It was an apartment complex that I bought where a guy took on too much debt. He uh, he was fully over levered. The banks were forcing him to sell. I made an offer. They didn't take mine. They took someone else's offer. And then uh, now another two or three months go by because it's like the due diligence research period. And then the last minute that guy backs out they called me back up and they said, hey, do you still want to buy it? I said, yeah, but not at the original price that I offered. So then I got a, a great deal on it. And I uh, that that apartment complex has, has been, uh, we renovated it. And it, the value of the property more than doubled. Uh, and then we make a, a good rental income from that too. That's so, amazing. In your opinion, and not financial advice, yeah. what would be the next industry or asset, in your opinion, <coughs> that you think people should be on the lookout for? Well, <clears throat> I would say artificial intelligence and blockchain, but, 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 but don't chase the noise, man, because what happens with anything is people get excited and money goes in with artificial intelligence, you know, chat GPT made it big and you saw billions of dollars go into AI. And I was like, man, you guys are chasing hmm. the noise, right? Mm -hmm. What happens is bubbles are created. People get excited. People make a lot of money, then it bursts. Mm -hmm. And that's when the good opportunities really come up. So look for those good opportunities of uh, things that are going to really change the way that the world works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. What is a current goal that you're um, working to achieve? Uh, I want to triple the size of our briefs media newsletter by the end of the year. Dang. Hey, just to make it super shallow for this lightning round, um, who was a uh, celebrity crush that you had when you were a teenager? <laughs> celebrity crush? Uh, let's say, uh, who was Rachel from Friends? 
Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston. Aniston. Oh, yeah. There it well, is. That's my guy. That's my guy. <laughs> <laughs> if money wasn't a thing, like, it, it, it doesn't matter about how much you can make, like, what would you be doing with your life if money wasn't a factor? And I, I really don't think I'd be doing much different. I, oh. I get to travel. Okay. I get to spend time with the, the people that I love. And I have a lot of fun while doing it. That's such a flex. He's looking at us. He's like, money isn't a thing. Right now, bro. <laughs> What's up? What kind of question it. is that? Bro? I'm already doing it. I love it. I love it. Uh, dead or alive. If you could have coffee, dinner with somebody, who would that be? Oh, man. You know what? That's a really hard question because I feel like I've been very fortunate. Like the people that I really like looked up to and read books with, I get to meet them now and and that's awesome and do that. So I've been very very lucky. That like is like for example, Rich that poor that I got to meet with Robert Kiyosaki. Oh, yeah, awesome, with all, all the books that I read early on. So I've met all those people. So it's probably going to be somebody who is not alive. And and you know what, man, I really don't have a great answer to that. Probably. If I could have like, if I could say, hey, you can have coffee with anybody tomorrow, man. It would be my 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 grandma. Um, she's she's been going through dementia, so I, you know, she for a number of years she hasn't been able to speak. And so, if I could have me with anyone and like in a full capacity, it would be her again, man. Hmm. Oh, it's very hmm. sweet. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. What is your superpower? Being crazy, crazy <laughs> enough to believe in <laughs> random things. I love it. That's great. That's great. If you could go back in time and go back to your, let's say your your twelve year old self, and if you can give yourself uh, a piece of advice to your twelve year old self, what would that be? Think even bigger. Think bigger. I think you know. I, I think people think that I think big, but then as you start to see more success, you realize I could be thinking even bigger, and I would definitely tell myself to think even bigger. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, we love to um, uh, explore the concept of mastery, like you know us as Kinjas, and you know we're 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 we start with dance, but we we love to explore outside. We love to explore mindset. We love that's why we love having people like you in here. And um, you know Bruce Lee has this famous quote where he says, "I fear not the man that has practiced ten thousand kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick ten thousand times." And so the the simple concept of putting in time, effort, consistency, persistence, and just being laser focused on any given thing, you can you can master something, uh, big or small. What is something that you feel like you've mastered in your life? Oh man, I think I really mastered. The ability to, well, I'm learning the ability to really focus on what I'm doing. Because the thing before, it was like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Now I'm trying to bring it all together and make everything one wheel that feeds the other. And it, it's, it's, I know that it probably doesn't make any sense because it's super theoretical, but my mistake was just doing a whole bunch of random things. And right? they don't benefit each other. Now it's how do I do things that all mm. spin the same wheel? Mm-hmm. So working on less, at least that's something that I've I really learned a lot of. Yeah, I don't know if I don't think I've mastered it, but I've learned a lot of it. That itself, I think, is mastery, like of like your own ability to spin many wheels and be like, you know what, that's not that's not the most efficient way to do things, especially like you know as you are progressing through life, you're married now, and and like you know being able to be like yo i need to like cut out the noise and then or or figure out how that noise can be one and the same yeah. and and that i think is is a self awareness sort of mastery too so that's really dope bro jaspreet uh first of all thank you for your time man we know oh, you're man. N- you're not you don't live here in la so you know we we made the pocket to fit your time and thank you for coming through and you know, as we said, we could sit here for hours picking your brain and, and hope to, you know, be able to, you know, cross paths with you again, especially on this pod. Um, I, I personally learned a lot, man. I've been following your stuff without even knowing. Like I said, I was telling Anthony well, I earlier, I was like, Brad, but already, I've already heard a handful of your podcasts that you've been on. I just never saw the face too. I was like, oh, this guy. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I hella know him, but, uh, you know, for one, I want to, um, acknowledge your um your ability to simplify very complex concepts um and and i think when it comes to money and finance and all of that it could be very intimidating you know because we i think the tendency when it comes to money is like it's such a sensitive topic 
because yeah. everybody needs it to survive in this world. And then we also don't want to tread the line of like yeah. being unethical in the way that we go about um, attaining it and things like that. So there's such a, a so many sensitivities around it. Um, and then when it comes to financial education, right? Like, you, you know, you're, you're self-taught, you didn't go to school necessarily to study this stuff, but you have such a uh, robust um, way of understanding finance and even what money is, but also what it is to, to yourself, but what how money is just subjective to the, each individual too. But the the way that you lay out um, your formula, I think it is, is so... Uh, one, it's just really smart. Two, I think it's very digestible and understandable. And um, you know, I'm I'm personally just really um, thankful for your your knowledge and your Thank willingness you, to come here. I'm so excited for our audience to um, have watched or listened to this episode, and um, you know, would love for yeah, like this relationship to continue on, man. Absolutely, man. Well, I I love what you guys are doing. I love that you're doing it in the dance community as somebody who used to be a dancer myself. So I love what you guys Dang, are doing. And we didn't even get to go into your dance, yeah, sorry, <laughs> your man. dance no, history, dude, this, bro. This is awesome, dude. I love what you guys are doing. Okay. You're spreading Thank great you, messages. Great. I mean, this was a lot of fun and I would love to come back anytime you guys want, man. This was this was this was a beautiful man. So I really appreciate it. I love the dude, you guys are very kind, man. I love the kind words. I gotta write down like the things that you say, and I gotta figure out where on my website it is and really <laughs> put them proper. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, Thank you man. so much. Thank you, man. Like, like I said, dude. I, I think real, real knowledge and real gold uh, is out there for a lot of our listeners, and, and that is something we appreciate so much. And personally, I uh, admire you very much, and what you do, and what you have to offer. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, we'll toot our own horns. Definitely, it's dope. You know, being able to share anything with our fans, as long as it brings us positive inspiration or even just our artistry. But to like see like somebody who's been able to captain and hold the flag on something like you know a, a mindset that leads to things like financial freedom and success i'm like that's that's a really dope flag to hold man, man so I appreciate yeah. it. congrats yeah. with everything that you've done definitely we're going to connect we're going to stay connected um uh, but thank you thank you thank you yeah thank you guys so i mean as we said like we barely kind of tapped the well i mean uh there's so much for people to continue to learn from you like how can people follow your path what are some of the things are people going to do to learn more about you more learn more about what you're doing um feel free to plug i all appreciate that. that uh so minority mindset on uh youtube so i post content uh, every day same on instagram minority mindset uh if you want to sign up for any of the newsletters that are free briefs.co we have newsletters for investors and entrepreneurs if you want some education on how to start uh, investing, you can also check out marketinsiders.com. We have a free ebook there as well that can kind of guide you through making your first investment. And uh, oh yeah, if you have a business idea and you want to protect it with a trademark, patent, or copyright, buzzlegal.com. So I appreciate everything you guys are doing, man. And, super dope. Yeah. Super dope. Well, thank you for that. Folks, uh, if you guys are listening, watching, thank you, first of all, for just tuning in. If you are finding this episode for the first time, we have many episodes that come before this with amazing guests just like Jaspreet. If you're really digging what we're doing, please uh, hop into iTunes, leave us a rating. Five stars are always amazing. Write us a review. Make sure you're following us on socials. Kinja's podcast, Cast with a K. Again, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, follow us. Uh, let us know you're listening. We love uh, screenshots. I'll regram all that stuff. And we just appreciate your guys' time. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you guys on the next one. Kinja bang, y'all. Kinja bang. We out. Peace.